Scientific psychology involves a lot of research. And you can just think of research as the attainment of knowledge about some particular topic to either satisfy your curiosity or to achieve some kind of specific goal. And oftentimes this research will involve the collection of large amounts of data that you then would have to analyze to see if, for example, your hypotheses are supported by that data. So psychological research is scientific. It involves these data collection and analysis methods. But yes, of course, there are some kinds of psychology that are not so scientific, but these videos are definitely going to focus on the scientific aspects of psycho psychological. I should definitely explain what I mean by science. I don't know if you've ever had a science class before, so let me just briefly explain. Science involves systematic observations, measurement, and experimentation. And scientific conclusions are always based on like empirical, and that just means like measurable evidence. So you can think of the scientific method as a systematic procedure for observing and measuring phenomenon. And by phenomena, I just mean things that you can actually see or touch or taste or smell to answer a question about, you know, why something happens or what actually is happening or when does this thing happen, so on. So you can ask any all these different kinds of questions, but the whole one of the most important aspects of science is that you're dealing with like real physical data. You have something that you can point at and say, my conclusions are based on that. So I've already used a couple of scientific terms already, and I should really explain what I mean by those terms before we go any further, because these are really important terms when it comes to any science. Uh, first of all, the word hypothesis. The word hypothesis means an educated guess based on your observations. So it's an educated guess. That just means you know what you're talking about. You have done stuff before. You have knowledge about this particular subject, so you know what you're talking about. And it's based on your observations. So you've seen something or heard something that makes you have this kind of prediction, and then you create that hypothesis from it. So hypotheses are definitely not things that are, you know, wishy-washy. It's not like it's a shot in the dark or something like that. Hypotheses do have a basis. Your education and your observations. Another important uh, psych scientific uh, word would be theory. I'll, most people think the word theory is also kind of questionable. It's like you're just guessing. But in, in reality, a scientific theory is a model. It's an explanation. It it's interconnects all the different data and observations that have been done and it allows us to understand what's happening and make predictions about you know outcomes in the future. So whenever you think of the word theory just think of all these different studies that have all come to the same conclusion and we are basically summarizing that into a simple model. And a law is basically just a, a fancy theory. It's a glorified theory. It's a very concise theory. Uh, oftentimes it's written in mathematics. But we use these uh, special theories called laws to just make accurate predictions about future outcomes. Like you could consider gravity to be a law. Uh, one of the most important aspects of a scientific law, though, is that even though... Uh, we could potentially produce evidence to contradict it, we have not yet produced any. So that's what separates a law from a theory, really, is that we've, we would only call it a law if we've never produced a scrap of evidence showing that it could be false. And this whole could be false thing is really important. For hypotheses, theories, or laws to have any kind of relevance, for, for them to be at all important, 
they have to have the possibility of being false. We have to be able to prove it wrong for it to matter. If you can't prove it wrong, then why even bother talking about it? Why even bother researching it? It's like you might as well just come up with all these different kinds of crazy theories that nobody can ever prove wrong. What's the point? It's like, here's an example. I, I hypothesize that there is a invisible and intangible pink elephant floating right behind you right now. How could you possibly prove me wrong if it's invisible and intangible? You can't. That's why that kind of theory or that kind of hypothesis is garbage. It's pointless. We might as well not even talk about it. So that element of falsifiability is extremely important for scientific hypotheses, theories, and laws. But keep in mind, science, scientists are people too. And we make, you know, human mistakes and we use human terms to try to explain things. Like, for example, words like facts and truth are things that a scientist really shouldn't say. Like, we shouldn't say it's a fact that humans do X, Y, and Z. Because science doesn't tell us the facts. Science gives us evidence so that we can make predictions about behavior. It, you can't, if you want to learn the truth about reality, that's, that's more of like a spiritual quest. That's, that's a better question to ask like a, a preacher about what the truth is. Uh, in science, we don't, we don't use these kinds of terms. Well, at least we shouldn't use these kinds of terms because there's no way we can know for certain anything is true or fact. So that's definitely more non-scientific lingo. <clears throat> now, the reason why we want to base all of our statements on, you know, physical evidence is because we're trying to improve upon what's often called common sense knowledge. Like, with a lot of common sense, I'm sure everybody has their own common sense beliefs, but with a lot of common sense, there's not really much evidence at all to support it. Uh, and sometimes different common sense beliefs can conflict, and that can cause a lot of confusion. Like, for example, do birds of a feather flock together, or do opposites attract? Well, both of those are common sense, but those two things contradict each other. So which one is it? Well, we've actually done the research. We've done science on that particular question, and the answer is clearly that birds of a feather flock together. You know, romantic couples that are mismatched, romantic couples that are not similar in many, many ways, oftentimes they don't last very long, and they're not as happy in general. So it's much, it's much better when you're looking for, you know, a partner to f look for somebody that's similar to you in intelligence and education and physical attractiveness and so on. So the scientific method has a few steps, six basic steps. Uh, you'll see some models where it's five or seven steps, but it's always this same basic progression. It all starts with just asking a simple question. Then, based on that question, you want to do some research. This means, you know, hitting the books, going online, trying to figure out what other people have had to say about your particular question. If nobody's answered your question yet, that's great. That means you get to do some cool new research. But 99% of the time, if you have a question about human behavior, somebody else has already approached that idea, and they probably already solved that problem for you. So, like I said, if nobody has, now you get to move to step three, where you state your hypothesis. You make that prediction. Remember, it has to be falsifiable, otherwise you, there's no point in continuing. And then the next step would be to test your hypothesis to see if it is correct or if it is false. And you do that by conducting experiments. And when you conduct experiments, you're going to be collecting a lot of data, which you want to analyze next. And based on the data analysis, based on what you find from analyzing that data, you'll know if your hypothesis has been supported or if it's been proven false. And if it has been supported, if you've shown support for that hypothesis, now you get to go to step six where you're going to report your results. 
And when you report results, you're going to want to publish um, publish your results in what's called a peer-reviewed journal. This just means that the journal is similar, uh, is moderated and edited and put together by people similar to yourself, you know, other scientists in the field that you're in. That way they know if, you know, you're just making stuff up or they know if you've done a poorly designed experiment and they will reject you if they don't like your work. And actually that's very common. It's sometimes extremely difficult to get your work published because, you know, such and such researcher thinks that you're doing it all wrong and it's just like, I, I've seen at research conferences like people get into heated debates on silly little statistical procedures and things like this. You'd be surprised how you know physically aggressive some scientists can be. <clears throat> but if you don't support your hypothesis, you have you can't really report the results. We don't have journals out there that will accept you know null data basically. So what you have to do if you fail to support your hypothesis is start over. Create a new hypothesis and test that one. Hopefully it'll work out the second time around. If it doesn't, keep trying. Eventually, hopefully, you'll get there. Now I mentioned there's, there's only six steps, but there actually, you could conceive of step seven. Step seven would involve developing a theory. Now the reason why I didn't include this in the previous model is that it's not really a part of the model. It's, it's something that you're not going to want to do most of the time. So the only reason you would move on to step seven is if you finish the first six steps and you realize that your results correspond with many other people's results. And if all of that data, if all of that evidence seems to suggest a theory, that's when you're going to want to move to step seven where you start connecting the dots and trying to figure out what the bigger picture is. But remember, just like a hypothesis, this, what, if you do develop a theory, it needs to be falsifiable. So that's just the basics of science, and that applies to all sciences, not just psychology. When we talk about psychology, uh, scientific psychology, what we're talking about is also called experimental psychology. So this is when we use the scientific method to test hypotheses about human behavior and thought processes. Most of the time we're going to be using uh, human participants, but it's quite common as well to use animals instead. Remember, that's uh, comparative psychology. The whole point of using animals is not really to learn more about the animals. It's more so to just learn about ourselves by looking at animals in this kind of comparative way. Now when you do hu use uh, humans in your studies, uh, the PC term is participants, but we have traditionally referred to them as subjects. You don't want to call them subjects anymore because it kind of sounds like you're you know, subjecting them to torture or something. So it's much more accurate to call them participants nowadays. Now anybody can participate in a psychological experiment if they consent. So you would have to give what's called informed consent and that just means that the researcher has explained to you what the potential benefits and risks are for participating in the study and you are willing to accept those risks. But keep in mind there are some things that you simply cannot consent to. No matter how much you want to participate in a study you just simply cannot consent to things that are against the law, to put it simply. And if you can't give consent legally because you're a child or you're disabled or something like this, then your caretaker, your parents, can give consent for you. But that's only after they've been, you know, explained the risks and the benefits of participating and so on. And if these psychological studies sound at all scary, they're really not. In fact, most of the time, they're like what you saw at the beginning of this video. They're, they're pretty boring. You're just kind of sitting there pushing buttons on a keyboard, trying to stay awake desperately. It's, it's pretty tedious most of the time. So there's really nothing scary about most psychological studies. But when we do any 
experiment in psychology, we always need to make sure that we're doing it in the best possible way, in the most ethical way. So we do have a code of ethics for doing research in psychology. And in order to get any study approved nowadays, before we even start, you know, recruiting the participants, we have to uh, explain to an ethics committee exactly what we want to do and what those risks are. And if they don't like it, they'll just shut down the whole process there. You won't be allowed to, you know, continue your research until you fix the problems that they have specified. We didn't have these kind of ethics committees in the past. Uh, we're going to talk about a lot of older research in this class, you know, 20, 30, 40, maybe even 50 years ago. And most of these older studies that we're going to talk about are profoundly interesting because that what they've taught us about human behavior. But at the same time, they're kind of messed up. You know, the, the people who participated in these studies, they sometimes would have severe, like, PTSD because of it. And I often like to joke that, you know, all the cool studies can't be done anymore because we have ethics now. Now, when it comes to animals though, you know, animal subjects or animal participants, uh, like I already said, we, we use them quite frequently as well. And the reason we do is because there are simply some studies that can't really be done with humans. Like, obviously, um, if you want to do a study on, you know, behavior changes over multiple generations, that would take quite a while to study on humans. Like you're talking about decades and decades of research to look at these generational differences, right? But if you do it with rats or, you know, birds and things like that that have a much shorter lifespan and, you know, grow to adulthood much faster, now that research is going to be a lot more practical. So you can look at how multiple generations have changed in just the span of a couple of years. Also, besides that, besides that element of practicality, there's also, of course, the ethical angle. Like, some studies that would be clearly unethical with humans will oftentimes be found okay with animals. And I'm not talking about, like, torture and dissection and all those gross things that you might imagine. I'm just talking about, like, raising the animal in the laboratory. Like, most people are okay with having a pet rat. Well, just imagine raising a pet rat and breeding your pet rats in a, in a laboratory setting where all their needs are cared for and raising that rat for its entire life in a cage in a lab. Well, that might not seem, you know, ideal for some people, but compare that to raising a human in a cage in a laboratory for its entire life. Clearly, that's not okay. But I think most of us would be okay with a rat being raised and bred in a lab. So yes, rats are commonly used. Uh, we also sometimes use dogs, uh, monkeys, various birds, and so on. And the ethical guidelines for animal research are pretty similar to the ethical guidelines for human research. We generally at most research institutions we have a separate like ethics committee for animals than we do for humans because there are different differences in the you know ethical codes generally but we definitely have codes of ethics for animals as well so there you you will not be allowed to do research where you're just kind of cruel and mishandling and starving the creatures unnecessarily like we don't to put it simply, we don't allow people to just be cruel to animals anymore, unless they have an extremely good reason for doing that. You know, like maybe they're studying some kind of treatment for cancer or something, I don't know. But unless they have a really good reason, we will not allow researchers to mistreat animals in that way. Especially if that animal is at all endangered, like trying to do research on some strange creature. So we typically go with rats because, you know, pretty common. 